Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. Twenty-five strangers stand together in a gymnasium in Denmark. They look expectant and unsure, since they're all there to participate in some kind of social experiment. From this crowd of strangers, Thomas is called forward, and Aska is invited to come and stand facing him. The two young men look at each other nervously. The group facilitator looks at her clipboard and says, Thomas, you live with your family in a lovely house on Winkelhoge Street. Before Thomas moved in, it had been your childhood home, Aska. Asuka smiles and nods. Ah, that's right, he says. And the two men and the whole crowd of strangers chuckle. Soccer in the garden during summer, Asuka reminisces. Thomas interjects, I can imagine we play all the time. Matilda is invited to come and stand across from Asuka. The facilitators say that these two strangers, both in their 20s, have actually stood face to face before at a rugby match when they were 12 years old. The game ended 42 to zero, Asuka's team winning. Everyone laughs and they high five each other for a good game. Inger, an elderly woman with a kind face, is invited to come and stand across from Matilda. The facilitator says, Matilda, On the night you were born, 27 years ago, in Kristana, Inger was the first face you saw. You were my midwife? Matilda asks, astonished. When Inger whispers, yes, Matilda says, that's amazing, and leans in for a hug. With tears in her voice, the midwife Inger asks, You remember? (laughs) It goes on, each connection more astonishing than the last. Anna's husband had been out jogging in 2012 when he suddenly had a heart attack and collapses. Luckily, someone reacts quickly and saves him. Knud, will you please come up here, the facilitator says. Everyone, including Anna, gasps and applauds. They share a tearful hug, and Anna thanks him. Just below the surface, a total stranger can turn out to be someone you're connected to. Some of these connections are lighthearted. All three of you, for example, have a bulldog named Preby, or <laughs> Someone turns out to be the online gamer you've been playing with for years, never knowing them beyond the username. Some of them are deeper. A man who was in the fire brigade that put out the fire in your house. If we approach one another, we might find out that we share the same journey. Two refugees from Syria are introduced to Dorit and Jan who escaped to Denmark during World War II. And they cry and they hug, knowing that though they have never met before, they share a life story. And finally, a young woman of about 20 is called forward to stand across from the elderly Dorit and Jan. The facilitator looks to the young woman and says, it was your great-grandfather who risked his life by sailing Jan to Sweden that night in 1943. Can you imagine? 
All of this is from a video online that I've watched at least a dozen times and get goosebumps every time. When I first saw it, saw it, my throat like tight with tears, I said, how did they do this? Okay, is it real? How did they orchestrate this incredible set of connections? How? And then it occurred to me, what if it actually wasn't that hard? What if we're truly all more connected than we think? What if we give up the illusion of separateness for the truth of interdependence? For mostly growing up in New England and being an introvert, I tend not to chat with strangers in the grocery line or with my Lyft driver or with new people at a party. I mean, I do sometimes, but it's not my regular MO and I'm not always comfortable. What if that's because I'm expecting these people to be strangers? What if I'm expecting to have to work hard to build those connections? I work as a college chaplain, and one of the icebreakers I like to do with my students is to pair them up with somebody they don't know well and say, all right, during the next five minutes, I want you to to find out the strangest thing that you have in common. Go. And it's this room comes to life of people saying, oh, me too. Wait, what? I thought it was just me. Or like, oh, so close. People find out beautiful and deep things, shared fears, shared love. They find out strange things, like you've both had a close encounter with Julia Child. They find out bizarre things, like you are both champions in the state geography bee in middle school. And they find connections even to people they've known for so long. This is possible everywhere. It comes back to the saying attributed to the Irish poet, William Butler Yeats, there are no strangers, only friends you have not yet met. Think of this story by Naomi Shihab Nye, an American poet of Palestinian heritage. She wrote this in 2007, and I first heard it here, one of the times Reverend Kim shared it in a sermon. I love it every time. Naomi's story goes, wandering around the El Albuquerque airport terminal after learning my flight had been detained four hours, I heard an announcement. If anyone in the vicinity of gate 4A understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate 4A was my own gate. I went there. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress, just like the one my grandmother wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing loudly. Help! said the flight service person. Talk to her. What is her problem? We told her the flight was going to be late, and she did this. I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke to her haltingly. Shudawa, shubitikun, habibti, staniswe, min fadlik, shubitziwi. The minute she heard any words that she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been canceled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatment the next day. I said, you're fine. You'll get there. Who's picking you up? Let's call him. We called her son, and I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay with his mother till we got on the plane and that I would ride next to her. Thank you, Southwest. She talked to him. And then we called her other sons just for fun. Then we called my dad. And he and she spoke for a while in Arabic and found out, of course, they have 10 friends in common. 
Then I thought, just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? This all took about two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, telling about her life, patting my knee, answering questions. She had pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts out of her bag and was offering them to all of the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar and smiling. There is no better cookie. And then the airline broke out the free beverages from huge coolers and two little girls from our flight ran around serving us all apple juice and they were covered with the powdered sugar too. And I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag some medicinal thing with green furry leaves. Such an old country traveling tradition. Always carry a plant, always stay rooted to somewhere. And I looked around that gate of late and weary ones and thought, this is the world that I want to live in, the shared world. Not a single person at this gate once the crying of confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug them all, too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. Back to our stories of strangers, or strangers no longer in Denmark. It concludes with words that I want to take to heart. It's easy to mind our own business. It takes a little more effort to mind the community. But doesn't the feeling of having something in common, something that connects us, make it all worthwhile? We are here together during sacred time. These days in between the Jewish High Holy Days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are known as the 10 Days of Awe. It's a time of personal reflection, of taking stock of your life, taking an honest inventory of the places that you've missed the mark, and, and relationships in need of mending. And it's a time of communal reflection, too, as we name and confront the ways our communities have fallen short of being the best that we could be. There's a poignant prayer known as Ashamnu, or the Vidui, which is a litany of confession, listing our misdeeds. But what's amazing about it to me is that they are all in the third person plural, we, we as a people have missed the mark. We as people can do better. This year, I'm particularly stuck, struck by one of the concepts in that prayer, sararnu, which means something like, we have turned aside. The opposite of turning aside is opening our heart to connection and knowing that our fates are bound up together. In a world that seeks to divide us, that teaches us to fear the other, or at least to mind our own business, acknowledging how connected we are is a countercultural act. Building these deep connections is sacredly subversive. I lift up a guiding phrase from Beyond, which is the Boston Immigrant Justice Accompaniment Network. They often say, we fight for one another as family because we are. 
This is what it means to live out the first and seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism, the inherent worth and dignity of every person and the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. All of us need all of us to make it. And so, my spiritual companions, what if we are more connected than we think? What if, what if we give up the illusion of separateness for the truth of interconnectedness? How would we act differently in the world, in our congregation, in our relationships, if we expected friendship and connection? Together, let's build the world that we want to see, the shared world, where we stop being apprehensive about each other, where we take the powdered sugar mamu cookies. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. Let's start right here in our spiritual home. We are already connected and you are already loved. Amen. I invite you to remain risen and join hands as you feel comfortable for our benediction. Let's get connected. With words from Reverend Darcy Roke, there is too much hardship in this world not to find joy every day. There is too much injustice in this world to not write the balance every day. There is too much pain in this world to not heal every day. Each of us ministers to a weary world. Let us go forth now and do that which calls us to make this world more loving, more compassionate, and more filled with the grace of divine presence every day. The service begins when the service ends. Amen. Visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.